Bibi and Tina, the wild stallion, a stormy night. Rain pelted down on the road to Falkenstein, and a savage wind tore at the trees with all its might. Through the surrounding forest, a large, dark jeep towing a horse trailer drove with its high beam lights on. The driver cast a worried look in the rearview mirror, but everything seemed to be fine back in the transporter. The man again concentrated on the road as it bent into a long left turn. Up ahead, a piercing blue light flashed through the trees. Had there been an accident? He slowed the vehicle down as he approached a fire engine parked at the side of the road. Two men in protective gear were working with chainsaws to clear a tree that had fallen, blocking the way. A third man came towards him. The man in the jeep rolled down the side window as wind and rain whipped across his face. It won't be long now, he was told. You can leave in five minutes, he nodded. Again, he looked worriedly in the rearview mirror. The horse in the back had arrived at the airport this afternoon, and the vet had given him a sedative injection so he could be transported calmly. Nevertheless, it had taken over an hour to get the horse into the trailer. It had given quite a struggle. The man strained to hear any sign from the back, thinking that he had possibly heard noises. He had to look after the animal as soon as possible, he thought, so he decided to stop at Falkenstein. At last, the tree was removed. The man drove off again, but the horse had indeed become restless during the unexpected delay and was acting so wildly that the trailer behind the jeep began to rock alarmingly. He couldn't go on for long. There, at the side of the road, a blue sign announced a parking lot just minutes ahead. When the man had parked the car, he put the collar of his jacket up and got out. With his head down, he walked to the back of the trailer and released the latch on the left side of the tailgate. Just as he reached to do the same on the right, the tailgate received a tremendous kick from inside and blew open. The man staggered and stumbled, slipping into a huge puddle. The horse pushed backwards out of the trailer as the man hurried to pull himself up. Oh, take it easy, he said. But the animal was too excited. The storm, the strange surroundings, and the long confines of a narrow trailer, it had all been too much. Whinnying, the horse reared once and galloped off, disappearing down a narrow path leading from the parking lot into the darkness of Falkenstein Forest. The rain began to pour even harder. Bibi Blocksburg, the little witch from Newtown, opened her eyes. It was nighttime. Outside, the wind howled around the house. Onwards raged the enormous storm that had started just last night shortly after her arrival. Hopefully it will be nice weather again tomorrow, Bibi thought. She was on Martin's farm, with her friend Tina and her favorite mare, Sabrina. It was autumn vacation, and October was especially enjoyable at the stables. Bibi had been looking forward to riding through the Falkenstein Forest with Tina and her friend Alex for weeks. She had dreamed about it over and over, but in her dreams the sun had always been shining. Through the roar of the storm, Bibi could hear the calm breathing of her friend Tina, sound asleep in the bed next to her. Bibi felt strangely awake. Sleeping was now out of the question, no matter how comfortable and warm the bed was. The more she tried, the more restless she became until she could no longer stand it. On tiptoe, she crept past Tina's bed, gently pulled the window curtain to one side, and looked out. Unfortunately, a black cloud was covering the moon at that moment, so she couldn't see much. She could barely even make out the gate of Martin's farm, let alone the dark silhouettes of trees bending in the wind. The cloud finally passed by the moon, casting a bright light across the night sky. Suddenly, she saw it. At the front gate of Martin's farm stood a horse. Where could it have come from? In the middle of the night? In this weather? Bibi decided to wake her friend. She shook Tina's shoulder, but that wasn't enough. Bibi shook harder. Tina, wake up, she whispered. What is it, Bibi? murmured her friend drowsily. Is it morning? No, it's the middle of the night, Bibi blurted out excitedly. And there's a horse outside. Tina straightened up in bed. But our horses are in the stable, aren't they? Bibi grew impatient. I hope so, Tina, but I saw one anyway, 100% certain. Come. She pulled her friend out of bed and pushed her towards the window. <sighs> and where, pray tell, shall there be a horse? Tina said reproachfully after looking out for a while. What? Bibi stepped beside her. There really was no horse in sight, not outside the gate or anywhere else. Strange. It was there a moment ago. Tina shrugged her shoulders calmly. You were probably dreaming. 
or it was the shadows of the trees. Let's go back to sleep. But BB resisted. Nonsense, Tina, there really was a horse. If you're right, BB, we have to look in the stable, Tina said decidedly. Maybe one of our horses escaped. Yes, nodded BB. I think we should. At once, the girls took raincoats from Tina's wardrobe, pulled them on over their pajamas, and tiptoed down the stairs. For now, they didn't want to wake Tina's mother. There was still time to do so in case something was really wrong with the horses. In the hallway, they slipped into their boots. Luckily, there was a large umbrella in the stand by the front door, which they could use as additional protection. On the count of three, Tina opened the door and the two girls ran across the yard to the stable as fast as possible. Dang, we should have brought a flashlight, B.B. grumbled when she stumbled into a puddle and soaked her shoes. They finally made it, and Tina pushed open the heavy stable door. The lamp hanging from the ceiling cast only a dim light inside, but it was enough to see that there was nothing wrong with the horses. They either slept or stood dozing in their stalls. Sabrina greeted B.B. with a quiet snort. Hello, my sweetheart, B.B. whispered into her ear. Aren't you afraid of the storm? The gray mare rubbed her soft nostrils against B.B.'s shoulder. Well, B.B., everything is okay here, said Tina, after they had checked all the stalls. Can we go back to bed now, or is there anything else you want to see in this weather? B.B. shook her head. No, Tina, sorry. Maybe I was wrong after all. Five minutes later, the two girls were back in their warm beds. B.B. listened to the relentless storm that raged outside. Tina was asleep again but B.B. still had so many thoughts racing through her head. Had she really been mistaken? The little witch wasn't sure. Yes, perhaps it was just the tree shadows that she had imagined was a horse. In any case, it was clear that it had not been a horse from Martin's farm, for they were all safely in the stable. But if she had not been mistaken, then where would the horse have come from? B.B. concentrated so hard on this question that before she knew it, she had fallen fast asleep. Disappointment for Tina. Hey, sleepyhead, get up! Tina's voice danced in Bibi's ear. I have a surprise for you. What is it? The little witch asked. The sun is shining, Tina exclaimed. At least it was a moment ago. I hope it hasn't suddenly disappeared like your ghost horse. Of course, Bibi remembered the horse from last night. She jumped out of bed and rushed to the window. The sun was indeed shining high in the sky, turning a stormy night into a beautiful autumn morning. Goodness, what time is it? B.B. asked. Almost ten, Tina replied. B.B. felt her stomach rumbling, demanding a good, hearty breakfast. Mrs. Martin had already set the table for the two girls. Well, finally slept in, I see. She greeted them as they rushed into the kitchen. How about a hot chocolate? Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much for breakfast, Mrs. Martin. B.B. felt right at home again. A radio played in the background as the two girls enjoyed themselves. A tree fell across the road to Falkenstein during yesterday's storm, the announcer's voice reported. Falkenstein's volunteer fire department was able to remove the obstruction quickly, so traffic could resume unhindered. Mrs. Martin sat down with a cup of coffee. I wish the volunteer fire department would join us. Why, mother? Tina asked. Is something wrong with the horses? Bibi joined in worriedly. Mrs. Martin shook her head. No, of course I looked after them as soon as I got up. You two were in the stables last night, weren't you? She gave Bibi and Tina a sharp stare. They looked surprised and embarrassed. Yes, that's right, Mom, nodded Tina, knowing it was pointless to disagree. How did you know that? Well, Mrs. Martin took a sip of coffee. When I saw your dirty boots in the hall, I could pretty much guess that's where you'd been. You were worried about the horses, weren't you? Something like that, B.B. told the story about the mysterious horse she had seen. Or rather, thought she had seen. But I probably just imagined it, she added. Yes, you probably did, Tina confirmed. But tell me, Mommy, what happened? Mrs. Martin reported that the storm had knocked over an apple tree in the orchard. The tree, in turn, fell onto the paddock and broke the fence. Oh, I'll fix that in no time, said B.B. with a shrug. But Tina's mother shook her head. Magic is only for emergencies. You know that, Bibi, and you can't call it an emergency, although I would have liked to let the horses out into the paddock in this beautiful weather. Now we'll probably have to wait at least a couple of days until Roger gets back.
Tina's brother, Roger, was at a training course and wouldn't be back for a few days. Mrs. Martin drank her coffee and got up. Enjoy your first day of vacation, Bibi. When the two girls had finished breakfast, they went out to inspect the damaged fence. Bibi bent down to pick up one of the little red apples from the tree lying on the ground. She bit into it. Mmm, really delicious, she munched. Would you like a bite, Tina? Tina shook her head. No, but we could bring back some for Sabrina and Amadeus. Shortly afterwards, as they were off to the barn with bags of apples, Tina suddenly said, Hey, I have an idea. Alex can fix the fence. We're supposed to meet at the old oak and I can ask him. Will you come with me? Of course Bibi wanted to come. She was looking forward to seeing Alex again, but not before she and Tina would have their friendly race on horseback to the old oak. Her gray mare, Sabrina, greeted Bibi with a joyful neigh as she entered the stall. Bibi offered her one of the red apples that Sabrina crunched and chewed. <laughs> Bibi laughed. Do you like them, my sweetie? She patted the mare's neck lovingly and gave her the rest of the apples. She and Tina saddled and bridled their horses, led them out of the stable, and swung themselves up. For the time being, the friends would have to skip the friendly race. The ground was soaked and muddy from the nightly rain, and there were deep puddles everywhere so the girls rode leisurely through the Falkenstein forest, enjoying the midday silence. Only when the sharp croak of a jay broke the stillness did Tina begin talking. She complained that her boyfriend, Alex, didn't have enough time for her lately. His father, Count Falco von Falkenstein, was of the opinion that his son had to spend more time on schoolwork. Imagine, Alex spends every free minute for weeks with a math book instead of me, Tina resented. It's really not fair, is it? Not at all, Bibi agreed. Count Falco is too strict with Alex. Yes, but Alex is also to blame, Tina said with a frown. He goes along with everything his father asks him. He has to stand up to him a little once in a while. She shook her head as if to scare away the unpleasant thoughts. But it's vacation now, she announced, and Alex has promised to spend every day with me. Bibi and Tina had crossed the forest. Before them stretched a large meadow with the old oak rising majestically in the middle. The friends steadied their horses. Look, Bibi, here comes Alex, cried Tina. A rider approached from the northwest, Alexander von Falkenstein and his stallion Maharaja, a noble black Arabian horse. Alex, Bibi, and Tina reached the old oak simultaneously and jumped off their horses. When Alex gave Tina a kiss on the cheek, Bibi looked away, smiling. The horses also greeted each other with a familiar sniff and muzzle nudge before going off to graze. Hello, Bibi. It's good to have you back with us, Alex greeted her. Yeah, I think so too, beamed Bibi. Tina said exuberantly, Now the three of us can spend every day together. Isn't that great? She was very happy to have her boyfriend and her best friend around her. Alex, however, suddenly no longer seemed happy at all. Something seemed to be bothering him. What is it, Alex? Tina asked. Aren't you happy? I am, but... Alex began to tell them what was on his mind. The storm had blown some tiles from the roof of the castle garages. The Count had ordered that all the garage roofs be retiled. Work would begin the following morning and would likely take an entire week to finish. Is that all? Tina asked. Well, yes, Alex hesitated. Well, not quite. The thing is, my father wants... What does your father want? Tina's voice sounded tense. Well, he wants me to supervise the work, Alex now revealed. Like I said, it'll take about a week, Alex let his shoulders droop. Father thinks that now that it's vacation, I have nothing better to do anyway, he added quietly. And as the future heir to the castle, it would only be fair that I oversee the roof work. Are you saying that you can't see me for a whole week because of a few roof tiles? Tina's voice had taken on a shrill tinge. Alex nodded. I don't like it either, Tina, he said imploringly. But what can I do if my father wants me to do this? If that's what your father wants, Tina repeated in a cutting voice, then you can tell him that's not possible because you want to spend time with your girlfriend, that's all. But Tina, Alex tried to calm her down. When the roofing's done, I'll really have time for you. Oh, cried Tina, annoyed. And what if there's an earthquake and the castle tower collapses? Tina, please, don't be silly. Alex's face bore a pleading expression. Let me show you how silly I am. Come, Bibi, let's ride back. 
Tina took Amadeus furiously by the reins and tried to get moving. Tina, please stay, cried Alex. The workmen aren't coming until tomorrow. Today I have all day. Oh, for once the Count has time. And what if I don't feel like it? Fortunately, the two brawlers were quickly interrupted. Hey, look, Bibi cried excitedly. A moped was coming towards them from across the meadow. As it grew closer, Bibi could see it was a motorbike. The driver wore a red and white striped helmet, leather jacket in matching colors, blue jeans, and dirt-splattered cowboy boots. A few blonde locks of hair peeked out from under the helmet. It was Freddy, nicknamed the Sheriff. Freddy makes himself useful. Freddy had jumped on his little machine right after breakfast to practice motocross in the fields surrounding Falkenstein. The muddy ground did not bother him. Quite the opposite. For Freddy, there was nothing better than roaring and splashing through the puddles. Now he was racing full throttle across the meadow towards the old oak, plowing a deep track into the soft ground. Pulling on the brake, he spun the back wheel around so that the rear tire threw wet chunks of earth through the air, hitting the ground just before Bibi, Tina, and Alex. Freddy was clearly pleased with this performance of his own driving skills. He turned the ignition key, and the rattling of the engine died down. I mean, really, thank you very much, cried Tina, annoyed. Freddy was already used to Tina getting upset with him. Basically, he was even happy that Tina was annoyed with him. That only proved that she was aware of his existence, didn't it? That's how Freddy saw it, because Freddy liked Tina. In fact, he'd long had a crush on the girl from Martin's farm. But she was with Alexander von Falkenstein, and whenever Freddy tried to ask her out, he was turned down. Why are you in such a hurry, Freddy? Bibi asked. Oh, right, I almost forgot, Freddy cleared his throat. <clears> throat> uh, I wanted to ask if your horses were okay. What do you mean? Tina shook her head. You can see that yourself. She pointed to the animals, grazing quietly at a distance. No, that's not what I mean. Freddy removed his helmet and got off his bike. He told of how a horse suddenly jumped out of the thicket in the Falkenstein forest. It crossed the path in front of him and disappeared on the other side. Imagine that, cried Freddy excitedly. We were a hair away from colliding, but this little machine and I, he tenderly patted the handlebars of his motorbike, we're pros. At the last moment I was able to swerve, but it was really darn close. He stretched his chest proudly as he recounted the memory of his brilliant maneuvering. Well, anyway, I wanted to ask if all the horses are in your stable, Tina, because this horse must have come from somewhere. It was probably a deer that you mistook for a horse, laughed Tina. Now hold on, miss, Freddy shook his head. I thought maybe in tonight's storm a horse had gotten away or something. He was offended. Why wouldn't he know a deer from a horse? Just because he loved his bike didn't mean he didn't know anything about horses. After all, his nickname was Sheriff, and he had even started a Wild West club that summer with some of his buddies. They rode around in cowboy outfits, practiced lasso throwing, and spent the night around the campfire when the weather was nice. Tina realized that she had gone too far. I'm sorry, Freddy, she relented. There's nothing wrong with our horses, although she turned to Alex because she had remembered the broken fence at the paddock. Martin's farm also had storm damage. She would give Alex another chance, she decided. One last chance. She told him about the fallen apple tree and asked him to cut it down, then help repair the paddock fence. No, I'm really sorry, Tina, Alex refused. Cutting down a tree is no small thing. It really should be done by an expert. Oh, that's right. I forgot, Tina said bitterly. You're an expert on roof tiles. She turned away from Alex and stared angrily at the ground. Freddy quickly realized there was something wrong between Tina and Alex. He carefully approached Tina. I could do that, he offered. I mean, with the paddock, it's not that difficult if you know how to do it. Really? You can? Tina lifted her eyes and looked at Freddy in surprise. Then we could let the horses out in this beautiful weather. Sure, Freddy shrugged his shoulders. It's a breeze for me. I don't mind if we do it right away. Really? Tina's face lit up. You would do that, Freddy? Freddy gave a wide smile, looked at Tina with confidence and said, I'd do anything for a pretty girl like you, Tina. Cut it out, Freddy, Tina said, but she couldn't help flashing a smile. Let's go to Martin's farm, she commanded, swinging up into the saddle. Once back at the farm, Freddy set to work. With deliberate, skilled movements, he maneuvered the chainsaw through the trunk and in hardly any time at all had cut the tree into pieces. 
Alex, Bibi, and Tina piled up the wood into a neat stack. With some extra slats, Freddie then repaired the paddock fence. Everything was done within a couple of hours. Freddie took off his work gloves. That's it, he said with satisfaction. Tina was overjoyed. Geez, Freddie, great. To tell you the truth, she smiled at him. I didn't think you had it in you. She looked at Alex sideways, sniffed at him and said, did you see how it's done? But Alex couldn't answer because Mrs. Martin had just turned the corner of the stables. What, you finished already? She cried in surprise. You're a good kid, Freddy. Come on, Mrs. Martin. Freddy waved off her praise. It's my pleasure. But still, we're very grateful. Mrs. Martin turned to Bibi, Alex, and Tina. She asked them to take the horses to the paddock. Afterwards, we'll have lunch. You'll eat with us, Freddy? Uh, Freddy wiped his hands on his trouser legs. We're having spaghetti and tomato sauce, said Mrs. Martin. Spaghetti with tomato sauce, said Freddy happily. That's my favorite. Mrs. Martin laughed. So it's a deal. You're eating with us. While Bibi, Tina, and Alex led the horses into the paddock, Freddy quickly changed and put the tools and work clothes back in the barn. Afterwards, the four of them strolled back to the house. They were about to climb the steps to the front door when a loud clattering filled the air. A yellow tractor was coming up through the driveway. In the driver's seat was the mill farmer. He had a fist raised and his face, under a flat cap tucked with silvery hair, was flushed a purplish red. He stopped and turned off the engine. Impudence, he shouted. What disgraceful impudence, he shouted again. Bibi, Tina, Freddie, and Alex turned around, stunned. What's the matter? Tina asked. Bibi, Alex, and Freddie were flustered by the farmer's anger. Don't pretend you don't know, he grumbled at them. It really is an incredible, an abysmal. At that moment, Mrs. Martin came out of the house. She had heard the commotion. Good day, mill farmer, she interrupted him politely but firmly. What's this all about? The mill farmer, in his tirade, stopped. Groaning, he got off the tractor and stood before Mrs. Martin. One of your horses has gone off on its own and devastated my vegetable garden, he cursed. That's what this is about. Tomorrow I wanted to harvest my tomatoes and pumpkins, and now they are trampled. But our horses were in the stable the whole time, Mrs. Martin explained calmly. None of them trampled your vegetable garden. What makes you think that? Are there any other riding stables nearby? Yapped the farmer. No, but have you seen the animal that trashed your garden? Mrs. Martin asked. I saw what it did, the man retorted angrily, and that's enough for me. I demand compensation. Mrs. Martin turned to Bibi and Tina. Can you two ride to the mill yard after lunch and have a look? Of course, Mummy, nodded Tina. We will. The mill farmer finally calmed down a bit, climbed onto his tractor, muttered an impatient, Bye, and rattled off the farm. Bibi was preoccupied during dinner. What is it, Bibi? Tina finally asked. Don't you like it? What? Bibi looked up absentmindedly. Yes, yes. I just keep thinking, it can't be a coincidence. Mrs. Martin listened. What do you mean, Bibi? Well, tonight I saw an unfamiliar horse. And this morning Freddy saw an unfamiliar horse. And now the mill farmer claims a strange horse has torn up his vegetable garden. Something's not right. Maybe it was a wild boar from the forest, Freddy said. Bibi shook her head. I'd sooner think there really is an unknown horse roaming about. Well, who knows? Freddy chewed with his mouth full. I know I definitely saw a horse. What we're dealing with over at the mill farm, we'll soon find out. Alex, who had finished eating, carefully dabbed his mouth with a napkin. Does this mean you want to come, Freddy? He asked, not too enthusiastically. But Tina immediately shouted, Yes, that's a good idea. If the mill farmer's going to go crazy like he just did, we could use a strong man to rely on. When Freddy heard that, he tried to hide a smile. He was clearly gaining ground with Tina, and it looked as if Alex was going to have his work cut out for him. Well, of course I'm coming, Freddy chimed. After all, I want to know what this horse is all about. The fact that he just wanted to be with Tina was something he kept to himself. But not on your motorbike. Bibi interjected decisively. You'll drive the horses crazy. Right, and us too, Tina agreed with her. 
Freddie considered this. How about I ride with you? Now Mrs. Martin joined in. Freddie could take Rogers Pascal, she suggested. He needs exercise anyway. That cleared everything up, except that Freddie needed riding clothes, and they were at his place. When he rose to get them, Mrs. Martin shook her head. As angry as the mill farmer was, you shouldn't keep him waiting, she said. She smiled encouragingly at Bibi. Go ahead, Bibi. You can help out here. Just this once. Bibi rejoiced, raised her arms and chanted, Eeny meeny horse's nose, quick change into riding clothes. From motocross and splattered dirt, stack first the jacket, then the shirt. Whiz, whiz. With a pling, pling, little sparkling stars whirled around Freddy, who now stood before them in his riding clothes. His motocross clothes, on the other hand, lay neatly folded on the chair where he had just been sitting. Wow, he shouted enthusiastically. Magic is really practical. Bibi and Tina giggled because Freddy looked like he'd just come out of a Wild West movie. He wore high cowboy boots and a fringed leather vest. On his head was a wide-brimmed hat and a lasso hung over his shoulder. Very chic, said Tina. But what do you want the lasso for? Freddy shrugged. Well, I guess it was with the other stuff, he said. Sometimes I practice lassoing with my buddies. I'm actually pretty good. Now it was high time to leave for the mill farm. They took the horses from the paddock, then saddled and bridled them before heading off at a brisk trot through the gate of Martin's farm. The hunt begins. They soon reached the mill yard, where the farmer was already expecting them. He immediately led them behind the house. Look at that, he scolded, pointing to the large vegetable garden he had planted there, or rather, to what was left of the vegetable garden. The lettuce plants, the carrot and kale bed, and a huge patch of pumpkins had been completely trampled down and smashed. Could it really have been a horse? When Tina expressed her doubts, the mill farmer stuck his finger out towards a spot right next to the carrot bed. There's the proof, Alex said dryly, for what the mill farmer pointed to was nothing other than a fine pile of horse droppings. Freddy, however, was more interested in the hoof prints. Since he liked to read Wild West novels before going to sleep, he knew the most important of all trapper rules. Always read the tracks carefully. He tried that now. After looking at the hoof prints for a while, he actually noticed something. Hey, take a look at this, he shouted excitedly. Bibi, Tina, and Alex joined him. The mill farmer also came closer and inspected the ground. What have you discovered, Hawkeye? Alex asked with a slightly mocking undertone. In Freddy's place, Bibi replied, I know what Freddy means. That is really strange. Tina shook her head. Hey, don't make it so dramatic. Those are ordinary hoof prints, aren't they? Yes, but no horseshoes, Freddy replied. Stunned, Tina stared back at the trail. It was true. When a horse was shod, the horseshoes were clearly visible. In damp earth, you could even see the heads of the nails with which they were attached. But this was without a doubt a horse without horseshoes. Alex shook his head and said, Everybody shoes horses in these parts, don't they? As far as I know, everybody does, nodded Tina. Except the natives, Freddy suddenly threw in. I mean, in the documentary I watched, the natives were riding Mustangs, and they weren't shod. So far, the mill farmer had listened to the conversation of the four more or less without understanding. But now he shouted impatiently, Stop it! What are you talking about, natives and Mustangs? He waved his hand in the air. You think you can fool me? Well, you're wrong. Calm down, mill farmer, said Tina. We'll find out who tore up your vegetable garden, I promise you. All right. Anyway, the doctor advised me not to get so upset. I'll go in now and make my lunch, he grumbled. But if I don't hear from you soon, then, then, then I'll call the police, just so you know. With these words, he disappeared into the house. Phew, Tina exhaled. We'd better find that horse. The others nodded their approval. They went to their horses and mounted. Right behind the yard gate, they found the hoof prints of an unshod horse. They were hard to miss in the soggy ground. The trail led them to the mill stream, where the horse had obviously been drinking. Then the trail bent off further north. Freddy and Tina rode ahead. Bibi and Alex followed at some distance. Tina and Alex had hardly spoken to each other since their fight at the Old Oak, and now Tina was having a good conversation with Freddy. 
A few times, she even giggled loudly. Alex rode next to Bibi with a grim expression on his face. Suddenly, Freddy and Tina stopped. They had approached a road crossing the mill stream from the east where it served as a small bridge. What's wrong? Alex asked. But then he saw for himself. The trail had ended. The four of them dismounted. Hmm, said Tina. There are only two possibilities. One, the horse vanished into thin air. And the second, Bibi asked. It turned the other way around, replied Tina. You're right, Tina, Alex told her. He had retraced his steps and pointed to the ground. A little way off the trail they had followed, hoofprints appeared that led back south. They had missed them earlier. I think the horse was afraid to cross the road, Tina reckoned. Perhaps it was afraid of cars. Yeah, I think so too, Alex agreed with her. This time, the trail led closer to the mill stream, where the water widened into a small lake, again ending the trail. But no matter how carefully the four of them searched the surrounding area, they could find no other hoofprints. I suspect the horse swam to the other bank, Tina said. It won't get far there because it'll hit the quarry. That's right, said Freddy. If we're lucky, it'll be between the bank and the quarry. That's where we should find it. Tina and I will ride north along the mill stream and search the bank, Bibi suggested. If we can't find any tracks, we'll cross the stream on the bridge. Good idea, Tina turned to Alex and Freddy. You two do the same, only you ride south, and then we'll ride on the other side of the mill stream towards each other. Freddy whistled his teeth for approval. Hats off, that's what I call a great plan. As Freddy and Alex headed south down the river, Bibi and Tina trotted towards the road. The two boys followed the mill stream south for quite a while until they decided to cross in the shallows. They followed a dirt road to the north, lined with a long hedge of wild roses. Behind the hedge was the quarry with its steep, dropping edge. Bibi and Tina had likely crossed the mill stream by now and were coming towards them, Alex thought. If the horse was actually between them, they couldn't miss it. So there was no particular reason to hurry. Alex let Maharaja go at a walking pace and surveyed the surroundings attentively. Freddy rode beside him, whistling softly. Then Freddy's whistling suddenly stopped. Hey, Alex. What is it? Alex turned to Freddy. He hesitated at first, but then he boldly said, I have to talk to you about something. Man to man, so to speak. If you know what I mean. Alex didn't understand what Freddy meant at all. What did he want to talk to him about? Man to man. He shook his head in surprise. So, no hard feelings, Alex, Freddy began. And just so you know, personally, I really have nothing against you. Alex began to wonder more and more what Freddy was getting at. Freddy took a beat to adjust his cowboy hat. Then he finally came out with the words, Between you and Tina, uh, it's not going so well right now. Tina told me earlier that you were busy for a whole week starting tomorrow with some roofers or something. So anyway, I hope you don't mind if we hang out, Tina and I. What? Alex almost fell off his horse when he heard that. He struggled to keep his posture. What does that even mean, Tina and I aren't doing so well right now? He hissed at the sheriff. We're having a slight disagreement, that's all. Well, Freddy replied, I can understand you seeing it that way. I mean, Tina's a really great girl and you... I don't know how to say this. What makes you think you have the right to say anything? Alex exclaimed angrily. I don't want you to take this the wrong way, Freddy said. But if you really want to know, you're lacking a bit of guts. I mean, you can't even handle a chainsaw. And when your old man wants something, you jump right away. You're more of a... Freddy was looking for the right word. Yeah, right. You're a bit pathetic. Alex swallowed as his face grew red with anger. He took a deep breath ready to hurl a peppery remark at Freddy, when suddenly, Alex saw the horse. The Wild Stallion It was a black stallion. His fur glistened in the sunlight. He was grazing in the shade of a hazel bush by the bank of the mill stream. It seemed as if he hadn't noticed them yet. But after Alex had swallowed his anger, and, not to betray its presence, pointed silently at the animal, Freddy went completely crazy. Hey, there's the horse. Come on, let's get him. Giddy up, Pascal. And off he galloped. Alex followed reluctantly. He would have preferred to have tried a more careful approach to the animal, but it was too late for that now. The black horse threw himself sideways, spooked as he caught sight of the others. He was quite young, not very big, and bursting with strength and wild energy. 
His long mane hung down far below his neck. He reared up loudly, then bolted off to the north at a stretched gallop. Bibi and Tina eyed the surroundings attentively as they trotted along. Apart from a few bushes near the stream, there was nothing special to see, let alone a horse, until it suddenly appeared on the horizon. <gasps> Amadeus and Sabrina pulled back as the wild horse raced on. It was a black stallion, galloping towards them at high speed and followed close behind by two riders, Alex and Freddy. <sighs> when the horse noticed them, it stopped abruptly. Hooray, we're gonna take him in, cried Freddy. He must be crazy, B.B. hissed angrily at Tina. There was no need to rush the animal like that. The black horse now bounced nervously, prancing in a circle, desperately searching for a way out. He abruptly broke out sideways and made towards the rose hedge. He couldn't jump over it. It was too high and too wide. But with his sharp eyes, he had discovered a narrow passage. Behind it was a dirt road to the quarry. At a full gallop, the stallion headed for it and quickly disappeared a moment later. He's galloping to the quarry, cried Tina. Yeah, we'll get him there, yelled Freddy. But Alex snapped at him angrily. Stop rushing the horse, Freddy. You're gonna make him fall. Freddy hadn't heard Alex take this tone before and cast him a somewhat bewildered look. But Alex was right. Freddy saw that immediately. The stallion ran straight for the steep face of the quarry. All right, he muttered, holding Pascal back. I'm riding ahead. Tina now took the lead. Giddy up, Amadeus. At a light gallop, the four followed the fleeing horse. As they approached the quarry, they slowed their pace, dismounted, and wrapped the reins around the bare branches of a dead tree. The black stallion stood right at the edge of the quarry, his head lowered, neck long, as if he was checking how to somehow get down. But the rock face dropped almost vertically, and the stallion saw that he could not get any further at this point. He danced about nervously, causing a boulder to come loose and rumble down into the quarry below. The horse snorted in fright and turned in the direction of the children. Whoa, cried Tina reassuringly. Oh. Carefully, she moved towards him, step by gentle step. She took an oatmeal treat from her pocket and held it out to the nervous animal. Oh, my dear, repeated Tina. Don't worry, I won't hurt you. The stallion snorted wildly, his nostrils flared. Again and again, he struck the stony ground with his front hooves. Tina was only a few steps away from him. With utmost deliberation, she reached her hand even closer with the treat. Look what I have for you. The horse stood perfectly still, stretching his head forward ever so slightly. As Tina took one more step towards the horse, she hadn't noticed the scrawny branch just beneath her foot. A sharp crack resounded, echoing through the silence of the quarry. The black stallion reared on his hind legs and released a terrified whinny. Tina froze in horror as the horse's hooves hovered dangerously close above her. At that moment, Bibi's voice cut in. Plop, stop, whiz, whiz, followed by a pling, pling sound. Illuminated stars whirled between Tina and the horse's hooves, which all at once floated motionless in the air. It seemed like an eternity before Tina finally jumped aside. Tina, are you all right? Alex immediately rushed towards his girlfriend. Bibi followed close behind. Nobody paid attention to the black stallion at that moment. Bibi's distress call had only frozen him for a few seconds and now he rushed past Tina with a tremendous leap. Nothing happened to me, she cried. Quick, we must go after him. The stallion galloped back to the path where they had come. Bibi, Tina, and Alex hurriedly untied their horses and jumped into the saddle. Freddy was already in pursuit. When he had seen that Tina had escaped the horror, he had not wasted another second hesitating. He gripped tightly onto Pascal's neck and chased after the fleeing stallion. Go, Pascal, he cried. Step on it. Despite this strange command, Pascal understood exactly what Freddy wanted. He seemed to be flying across the meadow. They still couldn't get near the fleeing stallion, but Freddy knew he had a chance. They were approaching the road. One car after the other drove by, and the black stallion was too nervous to cross. 
That's what Freddy was counting on. At a furious gallop, he unhooked the lasso off the saddle. He'd done this often enough with his buddies. But all they'd ever done was throw at sticks they'd stuck in the ground. To his own surprise, this made little difference. Freddy swung the lasso and let go. The rope swirled through the air, over the black stallion's head, and dropped straight down around his broad neck. Yes, cried Freddy triumphantly, clenching his fist. I caught him! The black stallion whinnied loudly as he felt the lasso around his neck, his hooves pounding through the air. He tried to get away, but Freddy grabbed the lasso with both hands. Tie it, yelled Alex, who had followed Freddy with Bibi and Tina. Tie him up! Freddy didn't understand what Alex meant. What was he tying up? To what? He stared hypnotized at the lasso, which suddenly began to stretch. Freddy felt a powerful jolt, which ripped him from Pascal with immense force. Fortunately, the ground was soaked from the rain and quite soft. The horse dragged him through the meadow on his stomach, directly towards the mill stream. But letting go of the lasso was out of the question for Freddy. Suddenly, he understood what Alex had meant by tie him up. Of course, he would have had to tie the lasso around the saddle. Bibi, Tina, and Alex had followed Freddy's involuntary slide with stunned horror at first. When the fleeing stallion was only a few lengths away from the stream, Tina snapped out of her paralysis. Bibi, do something, she shouted to her friend. Bibi had also regained her composure and had already raised her hands. I'm already on it, she murmured and cried out, Eeny, meeny, motor Freddy, wild stallion, hold thee steady, whiz, whiz. Little witch's stars danced from Bibi's fingers, followed by a bright pling-pling sound. At once, the stallion stopped, but Freddy's slide wasn't over yet. He had so much momentum that he just kept sliding, right past the horse until... Hurrah! cried Freddy. Below him, he could see his own warbled reflection in the mill stream. His head was hanging over the embankment, and, luckily... His rodeo-style slide stopped there just in time for him to avoid falling in. Prrr, Freddy exhaled with relief. The lasso end slipped from his hands. He picked himself up and took a few careful steps. Nothing seemed to be broken, and he was not hurt. Bibi, Tina, and Alex erupted with excitement. Alex jumped off his horse, immediately grabbed the lasso lying on the ground, and wrapped it around the horn of his saddle. Bibi and Tina took care of Freddy in the meantime. Are you all right? Bibi asked. Freddy slowly looked down at himself. I guess so, more or less. That looked awful, cried Tina. Why didn't you just let go? No way, Freddy smiled again. It wasn't that bad. Luckily, the meadow is still wet. It was like sliding down a slide, and the horse didn't even drag me through the mill stream. You have Bibi to thank for that, said Tina. She cast a spell. Freddy tapped Bibi lightly on the shoulder. Thanks, Bibi. Thank you. But maybe... He looked down at himself again and spread his arms. Perhaps you could cast another one to clean me up a little? Freddy did look terrible. His clothes were soaking wet and covered with grass and mud. Only his hat was untouched, sitting impeccably on his head. <sighs> All right. Bibi turned to Freddy and lifted her arms. Eeny, meeny, Corey Scarp, now the sheriff's looking sharp. Whiz, whiz. No sooner had the witch stars faded when Freddy's clothes were as clean and fresh as if he'd just walked out of a Wild West store. Alex joined them with Maharaja on the reins. What are we going to do with him now? He asked, pointing his head at the black stallion who was now grazing in peace. At this very moment, the animal looked up curiously, as if it had understood the question. Although the black horse was now completely calm, you could feel the power and ferocity brewing within him. His eyes looked fiery, his fur silky. For a few moments, no one said anything. They were all enchanted by this beautiful horse. We'll take him to Martin's farm, Tina finally said. Then we'll see. Thanks to Bibi's quick thinking, the stallion joined them without resisting. Everyone was relieved when they finally reached Martin's farm without further incident. Police at Martin's Farm Mrs. Martin saw Bibi, Tina, Alex, and Freddie come back through the kitchen window. What's this about? 
she wondered, seeing that Alex had lassoed a strange horse. Mrs. Martin hurried out. That's a beautiful horse, she said, approaching the animal with utmost curiosity. Look out, Mama, Tina warned her. He's dangerous. Indeed, when Mrs. Martin came too close to the stallion, he snorted irritably and threw his head up. It's all right. Mrs. Martin took a step back and turned to her daughter. Where did you get him? Tina recounted to her the events leading up to when they caught the horse. Alex, Freddie, and Bibi did not spare any details either, and so it took quite a long time before Mrs. Martin understood the whole story. Now the only question is, who does the horse actually belong to? Tina ended. Yes, and what should we do with him until we find the owner? Mrs. Martin added thoughtfully. Bibi already had an answer to this. We'll just put him up at Martin's farm. Please, Mrs. Martin. Tina's mother nodded. There's nothing else we can do anyway. I wouldn't let the horse into the barn, Freddie objected. He'll break your stall. So it was decided to put the stallion in the paddock. It was no problem to lead him inside, but once there, he threw his head back and forth and tried to get rid of the lasso by any means possible. Bibi couldn't watch this any longer and climbed over the fence. The stallion snorted wildly as she approached him. Careful, Bibi, cried Tina. I just want to undo the lasso. Bibi turned to Mrs. Martin. Can I free him? Fortunately, Mrs. Martin agreed, and Bibi raised her arms. Eeny, meeny, mane of steed. Lassoed stallion, now be freed. Whiz, whiz. The witch's pling, pling resounded across the farm and in a flash, Freddy held the lasso in his hand. The black stallion had flinched from Bibi's glowing stars, but when he noticed that she had freed him, he whinnied happily and galloped jauntily across the paddock. The children could have watched him forever, but they also had to take care of the other horses on Martin's farm. When you finish the cleaning and grooming, please come in, said Mrs. Martin, and went back into the house. There's cocoa and fresh butter cake, the four of them had just led the horses outside into the sun when they heard the sound of an engine approaching. A car slipped through the gate and came to a quick stop, but this was no ordinary vehicle. It was a police car. I'll be darned, Freddy scratched his head. The mill farmer called the cops on you. I don't believe it. Tina was upset. The driver's door opened and a very comfy looking officer got out. He had a round head and a small mustache. Good afternoon. I am Chief Ted Limberkind. He introduced himself and smiled politely. And who are you? I am Tina Martin, Tina replied and went briskly towards him. And just so you know, Mr. Limberkind, it wasn't a horse from Martin's farm. That's right. Bibi stepped next to her and put her hands on her hips. The mill farmer was mistaken. But we've already caught the horse, Freddy explained self-assuredly and stood beside the two girls. Alex also chimed in. And in any case, it's out of the question for Martin's farm to pay for any damages. Um, what are you talking about? Chief Ted Limberkin blinked in confusion. Damages? He repeated carefully. Is there some crime here I don't know about? At that moment, Mrs. Martin came out of the house. After greeting the policeman, she asked him, Please tell us what this is all about. Yes, well, the man said, it's about a horse. A black stallion? Tina asked. Yes, indeed. Chief Limberkin looked suspiciously at her under his bushy eyebrows. How do you know that? Well, because we caught him. You did? Suddenly, the policeman was beaming all over his face and his eyes were shining. That's wonderful. Can I see him? They all accompanied the chief to the paddock where the stallion was grazing peacefully. Yes, that must be the horse, muttered the policeman. It looks exactly as Mr. Brown described it. Now he wanted to know how and under what circumstances the horse had arrived at Martin's farm. That is a longer story, replied Mrs. Martin. And since it was time for afternoon coffee anyway, she invited the chief into the house. He accepted visibly pleased. Over cocoa and butter cake, Bibi, Tina, Freddy, and Alex reported how they had caught the wild stallion. Amazing. That's quite impressive. Very well done, praised the policeman as they finished their story. 
I don't know how I would have found him without you. Mr. Brown will be very grateful. Is that the owner of the horse? Tina asked. Yes, that's him, Chief Limberkin nodded, took a sip of coffee and began his report. Last night, in the middle of the biggest storm, a completely soaked man had appeared at the Falkenstein police station. His horse had just broken out of the horse trailer, he reported. The man's name was Tom Brown. He was American and ran a western ranch near Redwell together with his German wife. The horse was an American Mustang called Geronimo, and Mr. Brown had bought him during his last trip to Wyoming. Geronimo arrived at the airport yesterday. Mr. Brown had picked him up and was going to take him to Redwell in his horse trailer, but on the way, the animal had escaped during the storm. So, those are the facts. Chief Limberkin interrupted his report only to have another piece of Mrs. Martin's butter cake. After he had swallowed an enormous bite, he continued. Mr. Brown has warned me explicitly that it would not be easy to catch this horse again, for it is a most unusual animal. Geronimo had been raised in a free-range Mustang herd, and after he was captured, lived on a ranch with other captive wild horses. Mr. Brown had discovered him there and arranged the transport to his ranch after buying him. But in order to use Geronimo as a steed, he would have to adjust to his new surroundings and be carefully broken in. When Chief Limberkind had finished telling the story, Mrs. Martin asked, What's going to happen to Geronimo now? Well, the chief explained, I will inform Mr. Brown. He will get in touch with you and pick up the horse. Then the case is closed. He rubbed his hands in satisfaction. If you'll excuse me, I really must be going. After the good-natured police chief got into his car and drove off, Mrs. Martin returned to her work. Bibi, Tina, Freddie, and Alex returned to the horses, as they had still not finished cleaning. While they groomed and scraped out hooves, they talked about the news they had just heard. They were dealing with a wild American Mustang. I think Geronimo is a beautiful horse, enthused Bibi. But do you know what that name means? Sure. Freddy, of course, already knew. You know these things. Freddy wasn't particularly well-educated, but he read a lot of Western literature and had gained quite a bit of knowledge in the process. Geronimo was a Native American, he said, a renowned warrior of the Apache tribe. For his freedom, he and some of his people fought for years against the U.S. Army. Though they outnumbered him, the Army just couldn't get him. No matter how hard they tried, Geronimo kept getting away and would continue to fight. Bibi was lost in her thoughts. The black stallion had also been born a wild horse. She would have liked best if he could have roamed the American prairie freely forever. But now he was here on Martin's farm. Bibi felt an irresistible desire to ride this horse just once. When she told the others, Tina warned her, I wouldn't touch him, Bibi. Freddie agreed. Even I wouldn't dare go near Geronimo again. I mean, we're lucky we even caught him and... But Freddy was interrupted by the phone ringing in the house. The friends paused their conversation to listen in on Mrs. Martin through the open window. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Brown, she announced happily. Bibi, Tina, Freddy, and Alex pricked up their ears, but they didn't get to hear much. You're welcome, Mr. Brown. Yes, everything is fine. Good, I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, Mr. Brown. That's about all Mrs. Martin said before coming out to meet the kids. Well, what did this Mr. Brown say? Tina wanted to know. That he'll come by in the morning with his trailer and pick up Geronimo, Mrs. Martin replied. He's very glad that you were able to catch him, and above all, that he is well. He asked us to be careful for our own safety. Geronimo may seem a bit used to people, but he is still a wild horse, so beware, children. I'm not going near this guy anymore, not if I don't have to, laughed Freddy. Besides, I have to get home. Can I come back tomorrow? I want to see Geronimo being picked up. Sure, nodded Tina and smiled at him. Freddy beamed back. Great, and how about we take a ride on my machine then, Tina? We could go to Falkenstein and have some ice cream. When Alex heard that, he bit his lips. Freddy was really pushy. He definitely made a pass at Tina 
but she'd probably give him a salty rebuff right away. I'd love to, said Tina. That'll be fun. Alex's chin dropped, while Freddie nodded confidently as if he expected no other response. After he got back into his motocross gear, he got on his bike and shouted, Well, see you tomorrow, before roaring away out of the yard. Tina waved after him. Turning to Bibi, she said, Actually, Freddie's a pretty cool guy, isn't he? I think I've always underestimated him. Alex broke into a coughing fit. Besides, he's a guy you can count on, Tina went on giving Alex a sideways glance. Unlike a certain Count's son. Alex ran red as he drilled a pebble into the ground with the heel of his boot. Uh, he said, I I'm going home now too. He hoped Tina would hold him back or at least say something nice to say goodbye, but she didn't. Okay, that's all she said. Alex took a deep breath. I can't come tomorrow morning. I mean, when Geronimo gets picked up, he stuttered. Yes, yes, I know, Tina replied indifferently. Come, let's take the horses to the stable, she turned to Bibi. Tina took Amadeus and Pascal by the reins while Bibi led her mare, Sabrina. Well, uh, goodbye, Alex stammered, but Tina didn't seem to hear him anymore. With shoulders slumped low, Alex shuffled to Maharaja and climbed up. He knew he should hurry back to Falkenstein Castle, as his father was quite strict about eating dinner together on time. But Alex didn't feel like hustling at all. He simply wasn't in the mood to gallop. Tina had turned him down, cold as ice. Alex still couldn't believe it as he trotted slowly away from Martin's farm. As he rode through the courtyard gate, Bibi said to her friend, Did you really have to do that, Tina? The poor things hurt. But Tina just shrugged her shoulders, unmoved. Come on, she said. He can stew a little bit longer. Apples for Geronimo It was evening at the farm. The animals were hungry and had to be fed. Mrs. Martin looked after the cows and chickens, while Bibi and Tina looked after the horses. When they had finished, Bibi filled a ladle of oats and pellets into a metal bucket. She walked with the bucket to the gate of the paddock and put it there. Come, Geronimo, she beckoned. I brought you some food. <sighs> Bibi lifted the bucket, but the horse only shifted its head for a moment before turning his back to her. Geronimo seemed to have no interest in the food or Bibi. But she didn't give up so easily. Bibi had an idea. There must still be plenty of apples in the orchard from the tree that Freddy had felled, she thought. I'll bet Geronimo would love them. She climbed over the fence and ran to the east garden, where she grabbed some apples and stuffed them into her pockets. Then she slipped back into the paddock and slowly walked towards Geronimo. Look, she cried, holding up a particularly nice red apple. The stallion raised his head. His ears twitched slightly. This one's for you. Bibi stopped, threw the apple in the air and caught it again. This aroused Geronimo's curiosity and he slowly started to move. He stopped only a few lengths away from Bibi, stretched out his neck, and eyed the apple. Bibi could literally feel his thought process. Should I or shouldn't I? She took a step towards Geronimo and held the apple under his nose. All he had to do was grab it. But instead, he blew a gust of air through his nostrils and threw his head back proudly before trotting leisurely over to the center of the paddock. Bibi was disappointed. Really? You arrogant bronco, she shouted angrily. She climbed outside over the paddock fence and leaned against it, sulking. Stupid horse, she thought. I don't care one way or the other. But then it dawned on Bibi that she would never gain Geronimo's trust that way, which she came to the conclusion was exactly what she wanted. Her contemplation was at once interrupted by a light touch on her shoulder. Geronimo! While she was turned away, not looking at him, the stallion had come closer to give her a nudge with his soft nostrils. Now he was standing right in front of her, not an arm's length away. Would you like an apple now? Bibi hurried to get one out of her pocket. This time, Geronimo took the apple from her hand. He seemed really hungry, seeing as how he was chomping one full apple after another. Bibi watched him with immense gratitude. Yes, you like them, my dear, don't you? 
She could not resist the temptation to stroke Geronimo and slowly reached out her hand. Sensing her approach, the stallion retreated immediately. He calmly stepped back out into the middle of the paddock, where he stood motionless, as if he was looking thoughtfully into the distance. The sun was already hanging low over the treetops of Falkenstein Forest. It would soon disappear completely, though a pale and perfectly round full moon had appeared in the dusky evening sky. The air had cooled considerably, and Bibi shivered, but she felt that something important had happened. Geronimo had taken food from her. Even if he didn't quite trust her yet, they had come a little closer. Geronimo was also a topic of conversation at dinner. Bibi told the others that he had eaten out of her hand, but Mrs. Martin dampened her enthusiasm. Geronimo is still a wild animal, Bibi. Maybe he has already got used to you a bit, but in an emergency, he obeys his instincts, so please be careful. Geronimo will certainly make a wonderful riding horse one day, but until then, it's going to take a lot of patience. I hope that Mr. Brown has that much patience, said Tina biting her cheese sandwich. Mrs. Martin nodded confidently. I had the impression on the phone that Geronimo is very near and dear to him. Well, if nothing more happens tonight, he can take him away in the morning, Tina said. What could happen? Bibi interjected. Horses are flight animals, Bibi, Mrs. Martin explained. And as I said, Geronimo's instincts are very strong. After all, he has run away before. If something frightens him, it can happen again. Bibi became absorbed in thought. She bit into a pickle and chewed on it for a while, before finally suggesting, Tina, how about we sleep upstairs in the hayloft tonight? I mean, the paddock's right next door, and we could step in if anything happens to Geronimo. Isn't it too cold to sleep in the barn? Mrs. Martin objected. After all, it was October, but Bibi and Tina assured her that with sleeping bags and blankets, they could make a warm, comfortable camp in the hay. Besides, tonight is a full moon, Bibi added meaningfully. Wild animals react to this, and you said yourself that instincts are very strong with Geronimo. Really? Well, if you think the full moon could be dangerous, Mrs. Martin smiled. In any case, she no longer objected to the two girls sleeping in the hayloft. So Bibi and Tina brought their sleeping bags, blankets, a flashlight, and a packet of biscuits to the stable and settled down on the top of the hayloft. An hour later, Martin's farm was bathed in evening darkness. Through the gable window of the stables, the faint ray of their flashlight escaped into the night sky. Bibi lay on her back, her head leaning on her forearm. Ah, oh, what could be better, she sighed happily. She looked at Tina with satisfaction. I'm so happy to be sleeping here in the hayloft again, she said. This will probably be the last time this year. Her friend Tina, however, seemed anything but happy. On the contrary, she looked rather downhearted. Tina, what's wrong? Bibi inquired nervously. But suddenly she knew. It's Alex, isn't it? Tina just nodded. That stupid guy, she said. He doesn't care about me at all. She looked sadly at her friend. Alex was pretty jealous today, I think, said Bibi. And I think he had reason to be. Alex? Jealous? Jealous of what? Tina pretended to be completely clueless. And of whom? Really? Well, Freddie, of course. You and the sheriff were getting along pretty well today. When Tina heard that, she laughed out loud. But then she said softly, if it's true that Alex is jealous, he might still be interested in me, don't you think? Bibi shook her head. Really, Tina, she said wholeheartedly. Of course Alex is interested in you. Anyone can see that. You think so? I'm certain of it. Tina lay back down, her thoughts racing. Then she finally turned off the flashlight. After a while, Bibi heard her voice. I feel much better now, Tina said. Bibi smiled. Good night, Tina. Good night, Bibi. Soon both girls were asleep. Though all the lights were out, the luminescent moon cast an ethereal glow over the entire courtyard of Martin's farm. A Daring Plan Count Falco von Falkenstein strolled up and down in his rose garden after dinner, 
he loved to enjoy the flower's beauty after the day's troubles, as he would often say. A faint patter of hooves echoed around the Count's ear. His son Alexander soon trotted through the castle gates, then dismounted before coming towards him with Maharaja. Good evening, father, he said rather sheepishly. Count Falco raised his eyebrows. How nice that the prodigal son is finally coming home, he said with reprehension in his voice. Unfortunately, I had to dine tonight without your esteemed presence. I'm sorry, father, Alex replied. I was with Tina. After that greeting, Alex had no desire to explain to his father what had happened today and why he was late. He didn't mention the Geronimo incident or the fight with Tina. I can see that it's late, the Count resumed. He pulled out his gold pocket watch, let it snap open, and studied it for a moment before continuing. You realize that the kitchen is already closed? If you are hungry, you will have to prepare something for yourself. Yes, Father, Alex nodded. I'll take Maharaja to the stable first. One moment, please, Count Falco frowned even more. The workmen will arrive tomorrow morning at eight, as you may recall. I advise you to be on time for once. I repeat, on time. Alex nodded again. Yes, father. He led Maharaja to the stable. All he wanted now was to be left alone. When Harry, the stableman, grumpily offered to take care of Maharaja, Alex waved him off. Thank you, Harry. I'll do it myself. Wouldn't you like something to eat first? The groom asked more politely. I'm not hungry. Alex replied. You can call it a day. Harry smiled gratefully at him and left the stable. Alex really wasn't hungry. The quarrel with Tina, their unpleasant farewell, the equally unpleasant greeting from his father, and the prospect of tomorrow, all this thoroughly spoiled his appetite. To clean and groom Maharaja would hopefully lift his spirits a bit. He unsaddled his stallion and set to work. The routine even strokes with the brush and mane comb, the smell and closeness of the horse, there was always something calming about these combined movements. But today it was different. Alex was unfocused and nervous, and Maharaja felt that. Again and again, he gave an irritated snort. I'm sorry, my dear, Alex apologized. I don't know what's wrong with me either. He finished his duties, gave Maharaja his ration of oats, and left the stable. He decided to read a little more and then go to bed early. But first he had to say goodnight to his father, also something that Count Falco von Falkenstein attached great importance to. In the meantime, the Count had said goodbye to his roses and returned back to his study. He wanted to check the cost estimate from the roofing company, which he had received earlier during the day. At that moment there was a knock on the door as Alexander hesitantly entered the study. The Count looked up from his documents. Yes, what is it? I just wanted to say goodnight to you, Alex replied. So early? Well then, goodnight, my son. Goodnight, father. Alex wanted to close the door again. Alexander? Count Falco took off his monocle and looked at his son with a good eye. What's wrong with you, Alexander? You don't seem quite yourself today. Alex sensed that his father actually meant well offering to help him in his own parental way. But he was not in the mood to talk now and shook his head somewhat defiantly. Everything's fine, father. It's just a few problems with Tina, he added. Ah, such is love. An amused smile appeared on the Count's lips. Yes, I get it. I mean to say, I've been no stranger to such feelings on occasion, he added, nodding encouragingly at his son. The attempt to cheer him up didn't seem to have been entirely successful, however, as Alex's thoughts remained serious and closed. Yes, father, he said, of course, you're right. But he wasn't dismissed yet. Alexander, said Count Falco, this time in a more deliberate voice. If you have something on your mind that you would like to discuss with me, I am here for you. Thank you, father, but for the moment there's no need, Alex replied. As you wish, and now Alex closed the door for good. Count Falco put his monocle back on and looked around pondering for a while. Oh yes, the sweet sorrows of youth, he murmured, sinking into his own recollections for a while longer. After he had showered, brushed his teeth and put on pajamas, 
Alex went straight to his room. He stood indecisively in front of the bookshelf for quite a while until he finally pulled out a book about horse breeds. In it, there was also a chapter about American Mustangs. Alex read that Mustangs were descendants of thoroughbreds, a majestic, noble horse breed left behind by Spanish settlers in America during the 16th century. Through their free life in the wilderness, they had developed into incredibly strong, tough, and fast horses. They lived in herds led by an alpha mare and were sociable, playful, and intelligent. They had rock-hard hooves with which they could defend themselves against any enemy and did not need shoeing. Alex looked up from the book. He thought of Freddy because he had discovered that Geronimo was unshod. Yeah, Freddy had been at the top of his game today. Alex had to admit that. Tina had also gotten along with him very well, while she had hardly paid any attention at all to Alex. She was mad at him about the roofing work, but why didn't she understand how important it was to keep Falkenstein Castle in top condition at all times, Alex wondered. After all, the castle had been in the family for over 750 years. Alex shook his head, his thoughts having taken him by surprise. He was still holding the book on horse breeds, and so he read on. The noble characteristics of the Mustangs had made them very popular with the Native Americans, and also later with the cowboys. Because of their free life in the prairie, however, they had become extremely headstrong and proud animals whose trust was difficult to win. They had to be carefully tamed and broken in, but once they had put their trust in someone, they were the most loyal and best companions one could ever wish for. And so the chapter ended. Alex closed the book and put it back on the shelf. He decided to go to bed, knowing otherwise he would only have a mess of thoughts keeping him awake. Tomorrow, the world would look wondrous and new again. Or so he hoped. Alex crawled under the covers and closed his eyes. But immediately, the day's events came rushing back. The fight with Tina at the Old Oak. How Freddy had explained to him that he thought he was a wimp. That he had no guts and how this brazen fellow had also told him, man to man, that he intended to have a date with Tina. Alex's heart suddenly beat faster. He wondered if Tina thought he was a wimp too, and if she thought he didn't have guts either. She had replied, I'd love to, it'll be fun, when Freddy asked her out. Alex tried to calm down, but Freddy was no wimp. He certainly had courage and determination. He could even lasso a fleeing Mustang, what did Tina say? Freddy's actually a pretty cool guy? She said that, didn't she? Alex couldn't stay in bed any longer. He threw the blanket back and got up, walking restlessly over to the window. The full moon was shining bright in the night sky. Alex forced himself to take several deep breaths until his thoughts finally calmed. He had to talk to Tina. Yes, tonight. He'd get on Maharaja and ride to Martin's farm. Right now. He'd throw little stones at Tina's window and explain everything until they made up. But would Tina even open the window if she saw him? Alex clenched his hands into fists. No, he decided. He had to give Tina a good reason to miss out on that ride with Freddy. Alex remembered how coldly she treated him when they said goodbye. She had nearly dumped him outright. Alex stared desperately up at the full moon. What could he do? As he stood there, he remembered what he had just read. Mustangs need to be tamed and broken in, he muttered, lost in thought. <sighs> Freddy's words came back to him. Even I wouldn't dare go near that Geronimo again. That's what Freddy had said. All of a sudden, everything came together, like puzzle pieces forming a complete picture. A plan began to take shape in Alex's mind. A daring plan. If he carried it out, no one would ever call him a wimp and say he didn't have guts again. And if he threw pebbles at Tina's window then, she would surely open it. Two hours later, while the Count was fast asleep, the door to Alexander's room quietly opened. He stepped out into the hall. Alex was wearing his riding clothes, holding his boots in his hand. On tiptoe, he crept down the corridor, past his father's bedroom, and down the stairs into the hall. Shortly after he had left the castle, he put his boots on and ran across the courtyard to the stable, where he pushed open the creaking door and slipped inside. 
Maharaja snorted excitedly as Alex saddled and bridled him. Shh, Maharaja, Alex whispered and patted his neck. When the horse had calmed down, he led it out of the stable by the bridle through the heavy iron castle gate. Only then did he mount his great black stallion. Go, Maharaja. The noble thoroughbred Arabian galloped off. Alex could find his way to Martin's farm in his sleep. When he reached the front entrance, however, he did not lead Maharaja through the courtyard gate as usual, but rode onwards along the dirt road that led past the farm. Right next to the paddock, he dismounted and tied Maharaja to the fence. Geronimo had stretched out on the ground between the two trees in the middle of the paddock. Was he asleep? You'll be wide awake soon, Alex thought, and climbed over the fence. Determined, he tread carefully towards the wild Mustang. Full moon. Something was wrong. The thought immediately shot through Bibi's mind as she bolted up, but she was still so sleepy that for a fleeting moment, she didn't even know if she was actually awake. Then she heard the neighing. Sabrina? she muttered. No, the neighing wasn't coming from the stable. It was a loud, wild sound accompanied by hoofbeats. Geronimo! <sighs> Suddenly Bibi was wide awake. She struggled out of her sleeping bag and rushed to the gable window. The moon lit up the night like a giant lantern. She leaned far out, but could only see a small part of the paddock from the hayloft. Again, she heard Geronimo's neighing. Something was going on out there, and not something good. But Bibi couldn't see it. She had to get out. The next moment, she shook Tina. Quick, get up! What is it? muttered Tina. There's something wrong with Geronimo. Now Tina could hear the neighing and stomping from outside. What? In one move, she shot up out of bed. Luckily, the two girls had slept in their clothes, so they wouldn't lose time in an emergency. Tina grabbed the flashlight, and the two girls raced down the ladder and out the stable door. Out of breath from the hustle, they reached the gate of the paddock. Now it was clear why Geronimo was neighing. Someone was sitting on his back. But the girls could not recognize his face. Was it a thief? Then he had certainly chosen the wrong horse, for Geronimo fought back with all his might. Bibi and Tina had only seen something like this in an old western show on television, where the stallion leaps with all fours in the air at once, arching his back like a cat and using all means necessary to throw the rider off. But the Mustang was without success. As a horse thief, the man might be a failure, but boy could he ride! Geronimo galloped off and then stopped abruptly, but the rider was prepared for that as well. At just the right moment, he leaned back to avoid being thrown over Geronimo's head. The black horse whinnied angrily and spun in circles several times at breakneck speed, the moonlight illuminating the rider's face with a soft glow. That's... Bibi couldn't believe it. Alex, cried Tina, her voice mixed with anger and surprise. When the rider heard her, he looked up. He lost concentration for a second, and that was enough. Geronimo made a huge leap to the side, and Alex flew off his back in a high arc. Alex, cried Tina again, but this time her voice was full of fear and concern. Alex! In one bound, she swung over the fence and ran to him. Alex, she shook his shoulder. Did something happen to you? Are you in pain? Alex raised his head and groaned. No, it's okay, he mumbled groggily. At once, a piercing animal cry rang across the farm and all three looked at Geronimo. He reared up and broke into a gallop with thundering hooves, flying over the paddock fence with a tremendous leap before disappearing into the night. Quick, cried Alex, who had already picked himself up again. After him! Bibi and Tina ran to the stable. While they were still running, Bibi said, Eeny meeny stampede cattle, ready our horses, bridle and saddle, whiz whiz. A pling pling echoed from the paddock, and witch's stars sparkled before them as they stormed into the stable. Amadeus and Sabrina awaited them, excited and snorting. The girls mounted immediately and blew across the yard. At the gate, Alex was already waiting for them on Maharaja. The three of them chased down the dirt road where Geronimo had fled. 
The path led directly into Falkenstein Forest, at the edge of which they had to restrain their horses. To look for a horse in the forest at night? That was not an easy task. Oh, man, Alex moaned desperately. This is all my fault. We'll talk about that later, Tina shook her head. Now we have to find Geronimo. But how, said Alex. Bibi had an idea. She stretched out her arms and sang, Eeny, meeny, hooves a glow, reveal to us Geronimo. Whiz, whiz. Like a string of lights, a trail appeared before them on the forest floor. Without hesitation, they followed it as fast as they could. After what seemed like ages, the path illuminated even more, leading them once again to the edge of the forest. In front of them was the road which the friends cantered along until they reached the meadow with the old oak. Sabrina snorted excitedly. Under the big old tree stood Geronimo. Oh, my sweetie, Bibi calmed her mare. Geronimo stepped out onto the meadow and began to graze. The three night travelers steadied their horses. For a while, none of them said anything. The sprawling old tree and the black mustang against the silver light of the moon. The picture was just too beautiful. Finally, Bibi got out of the saddle. I'm going to him, she declared determinedly. Can't you just tame him with magic or something? Tina asked. I could do that, replied Bibi, but I don't want to. And why not? Tina asked. Well, Bibi hesitated. I just want it to work without magic. I want Geronimo to trust me. Tina sighed. But how, Bibi? I don't know exactly, but I have an idea. Tina shrugged her shoulders. Please, be careful. Don't worry, I can still use magic if I have to. Bibi left Sabrina with Tina and Alex and went off. They also dismounted, looking after Bibi with nervous interest. Where's she going? wondered Alex. Bibi did not walk towards Geronimo, but instead straight towards the old oak tree. There she sat down and leaned against the trunk. Alex wondered, I thought Bibi wanted to catch him, but she does nothing at all. Bibi knows what she's doing, Tina replied confidently. She looked at her friend, who could hardly be seen under the old oak tree, and then over to Geronimo. The stallion was still grazing not far away from the tree. For seemingly endless minutes, nothing happened at all. Tina and Alex decided to sit down. As the grass was quite wet, Alex unsaddled Maharaja and spread the saddlecloth on the ground. He and Tina sat beside each other. The soft moonlight across the meadow spread a peaceful mood. Tell me, Alex, what was that all about before? Were you trying to kidnap Geronimo? Tina finally asked after they had been sitting in silence for quite a while. No, of course not. Alex took off his jacket and put it around Tina's shoulders to keep her warm. Well then? Well, I wanted to ride him. You wanted to ride him? Tina repeated in a skeptical voice. Why? Well, well, Alex stalled. Mustangs have to be broken in, don't they? Yes, but not necessarily by you, and in the middle of the night? Well, Alex hesitated again. Suddenly he reached out his arm in excitement. Look, Tina. Tina looked up. Geronimo was walking towards the old oak. Bibi remained silent. Geronimo stopped again and grazed on as if nothing had happened. Well, what was it like? Tina poked Alex with her elbow. You were about to explain something to me. It's not so... It's not so easy, Alex stuttered. Again, he remained silent for a while, as if he had to take a long run-up to explain it. Finally, he said, I wanted to ride Geronimo so you'd like me again and not think I'm a wimp. He exhaled noisily. There, it was out. Pardon me? Tina still didn't understand. You wanted to ride him so I'd like you again and not think you were a wimp? She repeated. Alex nodded. Suddenly, the words gushed out of him. Freddy told me I was a sissy with no guts, and you got along so well with him all the time, so I thought that maybe you thought I was a wimp too, and that you were falling in love with Freddy, so I wanted to prove to you that I wasn't a wimp, and then I had this idea to ride Geronimo, and I thought... Tina's face flushed with love for Alex. Really? 
Really, Alex? You did that just for me? Sure, I did. I, I was so desperate to make up with you, and I just didn't know how. Then I got this idea, and I realized now that it was totally crazy, but I couldn't help it. Yes, Alex, that was really totally crazy, Tina said in a soft voice. She took a break and moved closer to him. But I also think it's really sweet that you're doing something crazy because of me. You know, I thought that you didn't like me anymore either. What? Why? Now it was Alex's turn to wonder. Well, I was so looking forward to spending the holidays with you and Bibi. Then some stupid storm comes and ruins your stupid garage, and suddenly you have no time at all. Hmm, Alex nodded. You're right, Tina, but you know my father. It's not exactly easy to deny him something. I just didn't know what to do. I'm sorry. Tina also nodded. With Count Falkoff and Falkenstein, it wasn't always easy to get him to see a different perspective. This she knew all too well. At the same time, Tina realized that she herself had behaved rather nastily. She had simply ignored Alex, and she had, well, she had actually flirted a bit with Freddy, just to make Alex jealous. Tina put her head on Alex's shoulder. I'm sorry too, Alex, she said softly. Can we make up? Yes. Alex lit up. A heavy weight was lifted off his chest and a newfound lightness took hold of his heart. He put his arm around Tina's shoulders and gently pulled her close. They sat there in silence, both relieved that their quarrel was finally over. All of a sudden, Tina straightened upright. Alex, she cried, look. The black stallion had set himself in motion again. He came even closer to the oak tree where Bibi patiently waited. Now he was right in front of her. Geronimo snorted excitedly and slowly lowered his head. Bibi gently stretched out her hand. Her fingertips touched Geronimo's velvety soft horse nose. This time, he didn't back away. He let her stroke him. Warm breath came out of his nostrils. After a while, Bibi stood up carefully and scratched him between the ears. Geronimo nudged her confidently on the shoulder. Well, my dear friend, said Bibi, patting his neck. Shall we go back to Martin's farm? Geronimo whinnied loudly. Come on then, said Bibi. She walked slowly and the horse followed her. Tina and Alex could hardly believe what they saw. As Bibi came towards them, Geronimo followed behind her like a faithful dog. Suddenly, he pushed her playfully from behind. What's up? Bibi turned around laughing. Geronimo whinnied again, raising and lowering his head several times. Hey, you want to play with me? Bibi was overwhelmed with happiness. Geronimo had gained confidence in her. A totally crazy thought came to her. Could she ride him? Should she try? Or would she destroy everything again? Bibi stepped next to Geronimo and patted his neck. Oh, easy, she said to him. Geronimo stood there calmly. Bibi reached into his mane and without a moment's hesitation, pushed herself off the ground and swung onto his back. Geronimo still stood there motionless. Alex and Tina, who had followed everything with eyes glued open, hardly dared to breathe. Bibi straightened up. Go, Geronimo, she said as calmly as possible. Gently but firmly, she pressed her lower legs against Geronimo's flanks, and the Mustang began to move. At first, it just trotted along slowly, but he understood Bibi's commands perfectly and seemed to enjoy following them. Finally, Bibi bent slightly forward and increased the pressure on her lower legs. Giddy up, Geronimo, she said in a loud voice. Tina and Alex were terrified when the black horse suddenly galloped off. Oh no, he's going too fast, cried Tina excitedly. Alex shook his head. No, no, Tina, he said, hardly believing himself. Bibi has him in her grip. It was true. Geronimo galloped across the meadow in the moonlight with Bibi on his back, her blonde ponytail waving behind her. Tina and Alex jumped up. They watched intently as Bibi galloped out into the night on Geronimo. Tina was worried about her friend, and only when Bibi came back after some time could she let out a big sigh of relief. <sighs> Galloping on the jet black stallion, the little witch blasted right up to where Alex and Tina were cuddling, bringing the snorting Geronimo to a halt. 
Now we're riding back to Martin's farm, she laughed. Yes, beamed Tina, let's do it. Alex saddled Maharaja again. As he wanted to return to the castle, he said goodbye to Tina with a long embrace. Well, I can't come tomorrow, Alex said softly, but I'll see you as soon as possible, okay? You will? Tina looked up at him and smiled. As soon as possible. Then Alex jumped up in the saddle. Goodbye, Bibi, he cried out, galloping into the night. Bibi and Tina trotted back to Martin's farm. This time, they didn't take the path through the forest, but over the fields. Tina led Sabrina on the reins while Bibi rode Geronimo. When they reached Martin's farm, Bibi brought Geronimo back to the paddock, while Tina led Sabrina and Amadeus into the stable and unhitched them. When Bibi came into the stable shortly afterwards, she cuddled up with Sabrina for quite a while, whispering to her not to be jealous. Finally, the friends were laying next to each other again in the hayloft, snuggled up in their cozy sleeping bags. The flashlight spread a dim light. Well, said Bibi, smiling, so you made up again, you two lovebirds, or am I mistaken? No, Tina exhaled slowly. We did. Just think. Alex was riding Geronimo to prove to me how much he liked me. Really? Bibi shook her head. I didn't think he could do something so crazy. Yeah, it was crazy, Tina giggled happily. But when you love someone that much, you sometimes do crazy stuff. She didn't say anything for quite a while. But then there was the full moon, she added. He was looking at the moon, and then he had this idea, he told me. And I thought the full moon only worked on witches and wild animals, Bibi smiled. It certainly worked on you and Geronimo, Tina replied. Or, how did you do that? That Geronimo let you ride him? That was pretty crazy too. It was, said Bibi. Totally crazy. And beautiful. I still can't believe it. The two friends lay there for a while in the nighttime silence, each one sinking deeper into their own memories of one totally crazy, full moon night. Finally, Tina turned to her friend and said, Okay, it's time to sleep. We have to get up early. She turned off the flashlight, and shortly after that, both friends were sound asleep. A man-to-man -man conversation. Alex hadn't slept very long when the alarm clock rang. It was only 6 a.m. With a gaping yawn, he peeled out from under the covers and sat up on the edge of the bed stretching his arms above his head to wake up. He remembered the night before. My goodness, he thought. Had he actually tried to ride Geronimo? Did that really happen? Or had he only dreamed it? But when Alex got up to go to the bathroom, all his bones hurt. That was proof enough. He really had fallen off the horse. He was thinking about the night's events. Yes, he and Tina had made up. Alex smiled. That's good. Tina wasn't angry with him anymore. Now vacation could really start. But there was something else, something weighing on his mind. The roof work, of course. That's why he'd set the alarm so early. The more he thought about the roof, the angrier he got. He didn't want to work. He wanted to spend the day with his girlfriend, Tina, Bibi, and the horses. It was only now that he truly realized that. Instead, he was supposed to supervise roofers, and for a whole week at that. It was unfair. And to whom did he owe this inconvenience? His father. Without asking, Count Falco von Falkenstein had simply decided for his son, you're on vacation now and have nothing better to do anyway. Those had been his words, and Alex had, as usual, only nodded and said, yes, father. But he had really earned this vacation. Every day after school, he worked on math until his brain had turned to mush. He'd hardly ridden Maharaja anymore, and he'd hardly seen Tina either, so it wasn't true that he had nothing better to do. Now he understood why Tina had been so angry with him. He really let his father decide all his plans. After he brushed his teeth, his anger subsided, but Alex still felt helpless and confused. What should he do now? Do what his father wanted him to do? Like always? No, he simply couldn't do that anymore. But what then? He had to stand up for himself. Suddenly, Alex remembered last night and how he had tried to ride Geronimo. It had been risky, 
but also unbelievably exciting. Even though Geronimo had thrown him off, he had held on bravely, he thought, and in the end, his crazy stunt had even had a good side. He and Tina had reconciled again. Well, muttered Alex, nothing ventured, nothing gained. That was another one of those sayings he sometimes heard from his father. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, Alex repeated thoughtfully. Resolute, he now knew what he had to do. Of course, he would talk to his father. After all, he had offered that himself last night, and now he actually had something on his mind that he wanted to tell his father, even if he would certainly not be too pleased about it. Quite the opposite, he figured. Alex felt his heart beat faster with nervous excitement. He had, after all, been sitting on a wild Mustang last night. In comparison, a conversation with his father was a small thing, wasn't it? Alex nodded to himself in the mirror to reassure himself. Then he got dressed and marched out of the room with confidence. Count Falco von Falkenstein was an early riser by conviction. The early bird catches the worm, he used to say with a reproachful undertone if Alex slept in longer than eight o'clock. But of course the Count didn't get up that early to catch worms. Instead, he loved to read several daily newspapers at length, occasionally sipping a cup of Earl Grey while taking bites of toast with orange marmalade. When Alex came in with a good morning, father, the Count took off his monocle and eyed him over the edge of the newspaper. Good morning, my son. Alex decided to come straight to the point. I wanted to talk to you about something, father. I've thought it over, and I've decided... He tried to suppress a sudden lump in his throat, but there was no turning back. I beg your pardon? Made a decision? Count Falco von Falkenstein's left eyebrow rose slowly. He was distinctly irritated. Since when does my son make arbitrary decisions, if one may ask? Since today, father, Alex replied firmly. I must speak to you about a certain matter, man to man, so to speak. Isn't that what Freddy had said yesterday? Alex now found the phrase very fitting. Is that so, about a certain matter? The Count repeated with a yawn before stretching and sipping his tea. Man to man. He carefully folded the newspaper and laid it down beside him. Perhaps you should sit down first, my boy, he continued. If you did not dine with me last night, we should at least have breakfast together. Yes, of course, father. Good idea. Alex managed to ignore the Count's reproachful tone. He took a chair and sat down. Since he hadn't eaten anything last night, he felt ready to devour everything in the entire castle kitchen. The Count rang the bell, and Butler Ecclebert hastily brought another place setting. He poured Alex a cup of cocoa. You may retire for the time being, Ecclebert, the Count decided. My son and I have something we wish to discuss. Man to man. Very well, Your Grace. After a measured bow and barely perceptible amused twitch at the corners of his mouth, Ecclebert left the room. The Count bent forward a little. Well, Alexander, what is it? I'm all ears, he said, and put his monocle back in front of his eye. Alex slipped uneasily back and forth in his chair. It's about the roof work, father, he finally replied. He explained to his father how diligently he had been preparing for school lately and how much he had been looking forward to vacation and seeing Tina and how she was disappointed yesterday that he had no time for her. The Count had listened without a word up until this point. Aha, so the wind blows, he interrupted Alex and raised his index finger. Tina Martin will calm down again, my son. As a future heir to the castle, you must above all learn to set your own priorities and fulfill your obligations to tradition. Alex had expected his father to say something like that. I agree with you, father, he replied. There you go. The Count, who thought the matter was then settled, reached for his newspaper again and began to unfold it. But Alex continued in a decisive tone. I agree with you that as future lord of the castle, I must learn to set my own priorities, father, but I can only do that if you are not continually deciding for me what I should and should not do. That was more than clear. The Count's face suddenly changed color. He put the paper aside without even bothering to fold it back up. Pardon me? How dare you talk to your father that way, Alexander? I won't stand for this. I will not be spoken to in that manner. He bent over and glanced angrily at Alex. And then it happened. Splat. Alex had to summon all his self-control not to burst out laughing. The Count's monocle had fallen into his cup of Earl Grey, 
sinking to the bottom like a leaking battleship after the fight and splashing onto his face and coat collar. The Count's gaze shifted crossly between his son and the teacup, confused as to which problem he should deal with first, the recovery of the lost monocle or the taming of his unruly son. The former seemed easier to solve, so he fished the monocle out of the cup with tweezer-like fingers. Here you are, father. Alex immediately handed him his unused bright white napkin. Count Falco took it without even looking at his son and laboriously dried his fingertips. He cleaned his monocle, pinched it between his eyelids, and dabbed the tea splashes on his jacket. When he was finished, he seemed to have calmed down a bit. Alex now continued in a conciliatory voice. I understand, father, that the condition of Falkenstein Castle is close to your heart, and I feel the same way as you do. The Count tried to adopt a somewhat dignified attitude, which was not easy after his clumsy mishap. At least I'm glad to hear that, he announced reservedly. But, Alex continued resolutely, during the vacation, I would also like to spend time with Bibi, Tina, and the horses. That is also very important to me, so I suggest that we take turns doing the roofing. One day me, one day you. I can't do it today, but I'll be there tomorrow. You can count on it. Well, well, tomorrow you'll be there, repeated the Count, lost in thought. Then he said nothing for a while. A soft smile began to play around the corners of his mouth, for he suddenly remembered how he himself had had a similar conversation with his father many years ago. And he had to admit, Alexander had a point. As a future Count, he really had to learn how to make his own decisions. The Counts of Falkenstein had always been independent personalities. This had begun with the founder of the castle, Leo von Falkenstein. All his descendants, each in his own way, had been unique, unmistakable, sometimes even a bit eccentric. But all of them had preserved their heritage and family tradition to this day. Falkenstein Castle and the surrounding estates had not been damaged in the last 750 years. Count Falco von Falkenstein understood that he had to allow Alexander to find his own way, just as his father had allowed him to do. He looked benevolently at his son. Alexander, he said with emotion in his voice, I am proud of you. Alex had just taken a sip of cocoa. Surprised at his father's sudden change of heart, he almost snorted it back through his nose. W what He stammered. Yes, I am. We Falkensteins have always had a habit of acting according to our own priorities. That's also a, hmm, old family tradition, the Count cleared his throat. <clears throat> In any case, Alexander, I am willing to accept your proposal, but only on one condition, Alex inquired cautiously. On what condition? I want you to be by my side when the workmen come and will inspect the future site. Count Falco von Falkenstein leaned forward and reached out to his son. Deal? he asked. Uh, man to man? Alex took his father's hand and shook it enthusiastically. It's a deal, and thank you, father. Alex felt immense relief as the Count once again returned to his newspaper. Had Alex been able to look through it, he would have seen that a slight smile lit up across Count Falco von Falkenstein's face. Mr. Brown A thick morning mist still hung over Martin's farm, and though Hubert the rooster let out a long, almighty crow, Bibi and Tina slept right on through it. Only when the sun was already high in the sky did Tina finally open her eyes. A straw had tickled her nose, and she had to sneeze so hard that Bibi jolted up out of her sleeping bag. Now they were both wide awake, and an exciting morning was waiting for them. Today, Mr. Brown would come and pick up Geronimo. Hopefully, Geronimo would find a home with him where he felt comfortable, Bibi mused, but the rumbling of her stomach interrupted her thoughts. At almost the same moment, Tina's stomach also began growling. After they had packed everything up and washed themselves, they went into the kitchen. Mrs. Martin had already eaten breakfast and was sitting at the table going through her daily schedule. Good morning, Mama, Tina greeted her mother. Good morning. Well, how did you sleep? Uh, fine, Mommy, Tina hesitated. Quite good. Did her mother know anything about what happened that night? Bibi and Tina had decided to keep it to themselves. One could not necessarily expect adults to understand such nocturnal adventures. Wasn't it too cold in the barn? Mrs. Martin inquired anxiously as she began to make a shopping list. 
No, Mom, not at all. Tina gave Bibi a conspiratorial wink. Her mother hadn't noticed anything. Lucky them. After the girls had had breakfast, they went to the paddock to check on Geronimo. They had barely closed the front door behind them when an engine came roaring towards the front gate. Bibi poked her friend mischievously in the side with her elbow. Your new flame, Tina. <sighs> Tina shook her head, faking exasperation. Very funny, Bibi. Not a word to Freddy about last night. This is between you, me, and Alex. Sure. Bibi felt the same. Freddy dashed through the gate on his little machine. Morning, girls, he shouted happily and turned off the engine. Is Geronimo still here, or has he escaped again? That's where we were about to go, Tina replied. You can come along and have a look. Freddy took off his helmet. I will. I'm just curious how Mr. Brown will get him in the trailer later. I wouldn't miss it for the world. The three of them marched to the paddock. When Geronimo saw them coming, he whinged and trotted to the gate. Hey, what's wrong with him? Freddy wondered. Instead of answering, Bibi reached into her trouser pockets and took out a horse treat. Geronimo took it with his soft nostrils and crunched it. Man, you have him eating out of your hand, Bibi. Freddy couldn't believe it. Did you put a spell on him or what? No, I didn't, Bibi shook her head. Freddy looked at her skeptically. But how did you do it? Suddenly he's as tame as a lamb. Well, said Bibi mysteriously, there's a certain connection between witches and wild horses, you see. It's hard to explain. A certain connection? Freddy was quite confused. Yes, Bibi nodded seriously. My Aunt Mania would say, it's the elemental forces of nature that work within us. Uh, the primal forces of nature? Freddy looked at her with disbelief. Well, if you say so. At that moment, they heard the sound of another engine. Was that Mr. Brown? They ran back. A truck with a horse trailer pulled into the yard and stopped in front of them. A tall, slim man got out. He was wearing a checkered flannel shirt, jeans and cowboy boots, and you could see at first glance that he was used to being around horses. He had dusty brown hair and a suntan face with bright green eyes. The three children immediately liked him. Good morning, he greeted them. Is this the right place? If you are Mr. Brown, then yes, Tina replied. That's me, Tom Brown, but you can call me Tom. He smiled warmly. And what are your names? Bibi, Tina, and Freddie introduced themselves, and now Mrs. Martin came out of the house, too. Hello, Mr. Brown. How nice that you have found your way here. Tom Brown shook her hand warmly. That was no problem. And you must be Mrs. Martin, he asked. The one who worked the miracle of capturing my Geronimo? Tina's mother shook her head, smiling. No, no, that wasn't me. It was Tina, Bibi, and Freddie. She pointed to the three children. And Alex, Tina added. He can't come today. He's busy. I see, Mr. Brown looked at the three children and smiled. You must tell me later how you did it. But first, I want to see Geronimo. As they reached the paddock, Geronimo trotted over to the gate. Mr. Brown shone like a schoolboy. Geronimo, he shouted enthusiastically. There you are again, my runaway. Geronimo whinnied in high spirits. He let himself be stroked and rubbed his nostrils confidently on Mr. Brown's shoulder. Tom Brown had a way with horses. You could see that at first sight. Mrs. Martin had noticed that too. Geronimo likes you, she said with a smile. He won't let us anywhere near him. He does with me, Bibi objected. She clicked her tongue and immediately Geronimo came to her and let her caress him. Mr. Brown looked at her in surprise. How did you do that, Bibi? It's very difficult to gain his trust. In Bibi's place, Freddie explained, it has to do with the fact that Bibi is a witch. It's the primal forces of nature, or something like that. Is it true? Are you a witch? I always thought there were no such thing as witches, said Mr. Brown. Well, I do exist, Bibi replied emphatically. You can't miss that, laughed Tom Brown, shaking his head. He wasn't the only one who wondered. Mrs. Martin also found Geronimo's sudden demeanor astonishing. Did you cast a spell on him, Bibi? She wanted to know. No, honestly. Bibi shook her head. Mrs. Martin was not convinced. Well, anyway, she turned to Mr. Brown again. Geronimo wasn't so trusting yesterday, but it seems he got used to his new surroundings surprisingly quickly, and at least he seems to have built some confidence in Bibi. Yes, that is indeed surprising, nodded Mr. Brown. But Geronimo is very intelligent. 
He must have realized that he's in good hands here. And maybe he has a special thing for witches. He smiled at Bibi. Can you tell us how you found Geronimo, Tom? Bibi asked. Yes, that must be an interesting story, said Tina's mother. We would love to hear it. Perhaps over a cup of coffee? Tom Brown immediately agreed to that. They went into the house, and Mrs. Martin brewed fresh coffee to serve with the remaining butter cake. The children were given hot cocoa. When everyone was settled and had made themselves comfortable around the kitchen table, Tom Brown began his story. He had grown up on a ranch in the state of Wyoming. Wyoming has always been cowboy and native country, he said. Even today, the Wild West can still be found there at every turn. Nature is pristine, and Mustang herds roam the prairies as they did hundreds of years ago. Mr. Brown had been fascinated by these horses since he was a child. But eventually, he left Wyoming to go study in New York City, where he had met his future wife. She had also come to New York from Redwell, to be precise, and was an exchange student at the same university as Mr. Brown. She loved horses and was an enthusiastic rider. During the vacations, they often visited his parents' farm where Tom would show her the wilderness of Wyoming and the wild herds of Mustangs. His girlfriend was as enthusiastic about these horses as he was, unlike many farmers in Wyoming. They were afraid that the herds of horses would eat the grass meant for their cattle. Because of this, many Mustangs were caught by order of the government. For just a small amount of money, any American could adopt these animals, and since their fate had touched Tom's and his girlfriend's heart, they decided to save at least some of them. But how? They came up with the idea to open a ranch near Redwell and offer Western-style riding there with real American Mustangs. Now we live with many horses and our three children on our ranch, Little Wyoming, near Redwell, Mr. Brown finished. His eyes glowed with enthusiasm. Bibi and Tina sighed. What a romantic story. Freddie also murmured, impressed. Really cool, Tom. Tom Brown went on. It was a lot of work to set all this up, but it was worth it. When time permitted, he still visited his parents in Wyoming. During one of these visits, Mr. Brown had discovered Geronimo at a ranch for captive wild horses and bought him immediately. I had never seen a horse like Geronimo, he said animatedly. I just had to have him. Geronimo had been living at his parents' ranch for a while, and Mr. Brown had been trying to bond with him. Finally, he had him transported to Germany. But the long flight, the terrible storm, and the ride in the narrow transporter had confused the stallion so much that he had panicked along the way. Thank goodness you caught him again, said Mr. Brown, looking at the children one by one. But now it's your turn to tell us. How did you manage that? Bibi, Tina, and Freddy now reported how they had caught the wild Mustang. Only last night's story they left out. You are real cowgirls and cowboys, exclaimed Mr. Brown. You must come to Little Wyoming soon and experience life on a western ranch and western riding. You can be my guests of honor. Wow, cried Bibi, Tina, and Freddy in surprise. They would definitely accept the offer someday. That much was certain. Let's say we go get Geronimo now, Tom Brown suggested jovially. You want to help me? Of course they wanted to. Even Mrs. Martin insisted on coming along. As they stepped outside shortly afterwards, they heard the clatter of an approaching vehicle. Who is that? Mrs. Martin wondered. But Bibi and Tina knew that sound. They looked at each other and shouted, The Mill Farmer! Vacation Dreams Come True it was indeed the mill farmer who rattled into the yard on his yellow tractor. One could clearly see that he was loaded quite heavily. He got off his tractor and immediately approached Mrs. Martin, Mr. Brown, and the children. Hi, he barked. Well, this has gone too far. You can't rely on anything these days. This really is complete and utter... Outrage? Bibi interrupted him. Uh, yes, that's what I wanted to say. The mill farmer scowled at Bibi, Tina, and Freddy and said, You promised to find the culprit, but what happened? Nothing. Instead of replying, Bibi, Tina, and Freddy just smiled at the mill farmer. What are you smiling at? He growled, expecting them to apologize or at least justify themselves. Tina shook her head disapprovingly. Really now? We're not grinning mockingly. Please know that. Exactly, Bibi affirmed. We smile at you with kindness. Besides, we've already caught the culprit. I'm sorry, but I don't understand, Mr. Brown said. Which culprit has been caught? Well, Geronimo, of course. 
Tina told him. She briefly reported that Geronimo had trampled the mill farmer's vegetable garden. I see, said Mr. Brown. But the mill farmer himself stood perplexed. Geronimo? He asked suspiciously. Who's that? Well, that was a famous Apache warrior, Freddy explained, inadvertently confusing the mill farmer even more. Apache? Apache? Native Americans? Uh, uh, he stammered. Natives have my vegetable garden? Why don't you come with me? Tina asked him. They all followed in a small group to the paddock where Geronimo galloped about in high spirits. That's Geronimo, said Bibi, and pointed to the stallion. That's him? marveled the mill farmer. He looked at the stallion with admiration. What a beautiful horse, he piped. The farmer's anger seemed to have subsided, and when he learned how Geronimo had come to Martin's farm, he apologized to Tina's mother. Um, I'm sorry that I suspected your horses, Mrs. Martin, he raised his palms. But how could I know that an American Mustang had trampled my garden? At this remark, resounding laughter rang out from the others. A deep, heartfelt laughter, which the mill farmer couldn't help but join in. When Mr. Brown offered him compensation, the mill farmer was suddenly transformed into the most generous version of himself. Oh no, he refused. I cannot accept this. Over some tomatoes and pumpkins, uh, the poor horse was just hungry. How about I put your garden back in order, if Mrs. Martin doesn't mind, Bibi suggested with a side glance at Tina's mother. She nodded with a smile. Would you really do that? asked the mill farmer. Why didn't you say so? You could have asked nicely, replied Bibi. It's often more effective than shouting. Yes, the mill farmer lowered his head. I must have acted like an old grump. Yes, you did, Bibi laughed. But I'll come by this afternoon and put things right anyway. With everything settled, Mr. Brown was ready to take the stallion with him. Geronimo followed him to the trailer, but then he stopped, danced back and forth, and snorted excitedly. He seemed to have bad memories of the vehicle. All Mr. Brown's coaxing didn't help. And even when he got into the trailer and tried to lure the horse with sugar cubes, Geronimo didn't budge. Can I have a go, Tom? Bibi asked. Mr. Brown nodded approvingly. Bibi joined Geronimo and stroked his forehead. The black horse calmed down immediately and lowered his head. Bibi nestled her cheek against his warm neck. You'll be fine with Tom, she whispered. There are meadows and pastures there where you can gallop around. You'll love it. Besides, I'll come and visit you very soon. I promise. Geronimo snorted. He still held his head down as if thinking about Bibi's words. Mr. Brown, who was waiting in the trailer, clicked his tongue softly. Come, Geronimo. We're going home now, to Little Wyoming. All of a sudden, Geronimo raised his head. He entered the ramp with dignity and stepped into the trailer, where Mr. Brown stroked him for a while and talked to him calmly. Finally, he came out and closed the door. Thank you, little Miss Magic, he said to Bibi. I hope you really do come and visit us soon. And then he turned to all the others. You're welcome on my ranch anytime. A loud, approving neigh rang out from the horse trailer, making everybody laugh. There it is, Mr. Brown pointed his thumb over his shoulder. Geronimo agrees with me. After he said goodbye to everyone, Tom Brown got back in the truck and rolled slowly out of the yard. Bibi, Tina, and Freddy ran after him for a few minutes and waved until the horse trailer with Geronimo disappeared behind a bend. When they came back to the farm, the mill farmer also said goodbye and rattled away, for once with a satisfied smile on his face. Mrs. Martin went back into the house to do some more work while the three children were standing undecidedly in the yard. Bibi suddenly felt quite strange. She was sad about Geronimo's departure, but at the same time happy that he had found a nice home. Tina felt exactly what was going on with her friend. She put her arm around Bibi and squeezed her. We will visit Geronimo soon, Bibi. Bibi smiled. The very thought of this made her heart much lighter. Tina, uh, what I wanted to ask you, Freddy approached Tina. How about we take a ride on my machine? He had a smile on his face. I just had it clean and oiled. Bibi chuckled when she heard this, wondering if Tina would be tempted by a freshly cleaned and oiled motorbike. Besides, Bibi suspected, since Tina had made up with Alex, she might not be so keen on going for a ride with Freddy. Well, well, Tina stuttered. 
Suddenly, they heard the distinct sound of hoofbeats and the three turned their heads. Who could that be? Alex, Tina cried in surprise. Alexander von Falkenstein came barreling through the gate on Maharaja. He swung out of the saddle and came towards her. Hello, everybody. You didn't expect me, right? Has Mr. Brown come in yet? He just left with Geronimo, Bibi reported. Ah, I'm sorry I missed him. But Geronimo is in good hands, Bibi summarized the most important news. Besides, we can always visit him. We'll tell you all about it later, Tina joined in. But what are you doing here? I thought you had to supervise the roofing work today. Well, I had a talk with my father this morning, Alex replied mysteriously. A talk? Go on, tell me, urged Tina. Well, I explained to him that as a future castle heir, I have to set my own priorities, and that today, I want to spend the day with my girlfriend. He smiled at Tina, who then blushed softly. You really said that? And he accepted that? Yes, he did, Alex nodded. So my father and I will take turns doing the roofing every other day. And the workers said this morning they could do it in four days. Oh, Alex, that's wonderful. Tina threw herself at her boyfriend. At that moment, Freddy suddenly had the uncomfortable feeling that he was no longer wanted. He somehow didn't think Tina Martin's bike ride was going to work out. But he had to admit that he had underestimated Alex. Freddy knew what a tough guy the Count of Falkenstein could be. You really stood up to your old man, he hummed respectively. That was cool of you. Yes, I think so too, Tina looked up at her Alex, overjoyed. Very cool. And he gently let her go. Um, I brought you something, Tina, he said almost shyly, walking towards Maharaja. What is it? Bibi and Freddy also watched curiously as Alex opened his saddlebag and took out a red rose. For me? cried Tina, turning redder than the flower. Where did you get that? Well, from the rose garden, of course, Alex said quite innocently. Your father's rose garden? Tina asked. Cutting off a rose there was a crime against the Count. Alex smiled and put his left index finger to his lips. That's just between us, isn't it? My father doesn't need to know everything. With that, he presented Tina with the bloom. Oh, that's beautiful, Alex. Tina gave him a loving look. When Freddy saw it, he shook his head and rolled his eyes. It was unbearable, he thought. That thing with the rose was just too corny. He had cleaned and oiled his bike especially for Tina, and then she made such a fuss about a rose. What are we going to do now? cried Alex happily. I would suggest a horse race, Bibi and Tina said happily. Want to come along? Alex asked Freddy. He was serious about the offer, and he wasn't angry with Freddy anymore. But Freddy shook his head. Thanks. Some other time, he said. I'd like to take a little ride on the bike now. Nodding to his friends, he said, See you later. Then got on his motorcycle, started the engine, and roared away. Freddy pushed the throttle faster. He was upset about Tina and couldn't deny it. Girls, he thought fiercely. They're like the weather. Sun today, rain tomorrow. Who gets them? So he praised his little machine. It was running like a charm, and even more so today after some first-class maintenance. Suddenly, Freddy had an idea that immediately put him in high spirits again. He would try to set a new speed record on his favorite track in the gravel pit. Today was exactly the right day for it. Freddy had already forgotten the letdown with Tina Martin when he turned his bike around and hissed towards the gravel pit. Tina brought the rose to her room like a precious treasure. She put it in a vase on her bedside table and looked at it with delight. Alex was so sweet, she thought. He was already saddling Amadeus and Sabrina downstairs with Bibi. When Tina came out of the house shortly afterwards, the horses were ready to go. The three of them swung into the saddles and galloped happily out of the gate. The sun blazed warmly from the cloudless blue sky as the friends flew past a colorful array of autumn trees. Come on, my sweetie, Bibi cheered Sabrina as the mare set off alongside the others. Bibi was overjoyed. It was just as she had imagined in her dream of the best vacation ever.